Random tables have been part of tabletop RPGs since the beginning, and indeed were part of the miniature wargaming rules from which the original role-playing game sprung. They have remained a part of virtually every rule set in some way or another, from the early ones up to the most recent. They are in every theme and are integrated in greater or lesser ways throughout most or maybe even all rules. Certainly, fan-supported material is rife with random tables to be used by GMs as needed. And of course, there's a lot of debate about whether or not a GM using a random table is being lazy or being creative. I'm not really going to talk about that here. What I am going to talk about, however, is a theory about what random tables really are and how to use them most effectively. As usual, I'm going to be speaking both to solo RPGers out there, but also to GMs who run sessions for groups because thinking about random tables and their design and what they mean and how to use them isn't just for a soloist. But before I get to that, it's important to talk about the fact that when we say random tables, we aren't truly talking about something that is random, because the word random really means something that's chosen without any conscious decision. And indeed, every single random table that we use or create is pretty much the opposite of that. We are consciously choosing what to put there, or a game designer has consciously chosen it for us. What we're really talking about with random tables is something along the lines of a semi-unpredictable group of things from which to choose. Does that distinction matter for the discussion? Well, let's get into it and see. The fact that random really means not even unpredictable, but semi-unpredictable, that it's a semi-unpredictable group of things. And I would argue for the context of RPG, it's a semi-unpredictable thematic group of things, because as we've seen in the examples of the random tables that I've shown you, and as examples of random tables that you know from your gaming, they're all with a theme. That's the purpose you use a random table for. You want to generate a type of door or a type of monster or a type of terrain. So they're already thematic and they're only semi-unpredictable. The implications of all this mean that they can be designed. And if they can be designed, we can theorize about what makes a useful, effective, powerful, memorable design. Before we talk in more detail about the implications of what I said, that is to say that these random tables that I'll continue to call random tables are not really random at all. I want to do some rolling on one of my favorite random tables. You may have seen this in another video that I've used, and we're going to roll first of, first of all here on the first column. I'm just going to take my five d6 and give them a roll. It doesn't really matter the order um, that I get. I'll just line them up here without really consultation for anything. And we got three, one, four, four, five. And I'm just doing this to show you how I will develop three, one, four, four, five. Let's see what we get here. Three is going to be remains, partially covered remains we have. They're partially covered remains with, they're covered with earth. They are crystallized and petrified. So perhaps some fossils or something with gems. And the keeper of these are lycanthropes. And they are going to see what type of remains are these. We're going to roll on the subtable for remains, which is part of this main table. And let me to remind myself where, oh, here it is down at the bottom. There, let's see, the rema remains of, or the type of remain, oh, of a tome, interesting. All right, now actually I think that, yep, there's a tomes, let's go further, there's a tome subtable right here. So let's see what tome of, of what kind of tome, one, a lexicon. So from this table alone, we have the partially buried, buried with earth, remains of some tome that is a lexicon, that is a, a dictionary, perhaps a um, guidebook to something, and it is guarded by lycanthropes. So this tells me that it must have something to do with the lycanthropes, with their transitioning, perhaps with, I'm not really sure, the secrets to their existence, whether they're happy or unhappy in that state, something of that nature. This is just out of the blue. Obviously, it's not connected to any story. But if you were rolling on this type of table, a ravaged, ruined table, in the course of an adventure, this could give you potentially a little 
basis, a nugget of a story, an adventure hook. Maybe that would tie into the story you're already telling. Maybe it would be coming out of the blue and give you a totally other direction. So out of that semi-unpredictable thematic grouping, you get something that can create a story. My thoughts on random tables in my own solo play are just this, that I want them to be, for the most part, things that will generate narrative moving forward, not just things to populate a room or a locale. The wandering monster tables and such that I would use, as you've seen if you watch my other videos, sometimes I will take them from existing rule sets, or I will take an existing rule set and give it some numbers or extract 12 or 20 or 10 or 8 of them that I can roll on and create a random table to bring something in. That's a random table that is going to give you something perhaps of a surprise that is, again, semi random or just unknown, really, a little bit semi unpredictable. But a random table that you're creating that is going to further a narrative or is going to allow you a narrative seed, that's really the random table that I would be spending time on thinking about how to create, when to create, and what I wanted from it. And the first step in doing that, I think, is to have it be something that can be named within the story or named as a part of a, an adventure hook or a narrative device. So Ravaged Ruins, for example, to just stick with this, this table. When you say Ravaged Ruins, it already suggests some temporality. It suggests something happened in the past that, is, that remains in some way that you have encountered. So it builds in automatically the concept that there is something predating the presence of the party or the adventure or the hero onto this spot in the story. You didn't have to do anything except give it this name or, for example, use this particular existing table to get to a place where you were in a place of history. And all of a sudden, you have a lot of different ways you can explore. And by explore, I mean narratively explore and literally explore the space that you're in. You have the option of taking a look here literally and digging through them and doing those types of actions and then perhaps rolling on some other tables to see what you discover. Or you have the option of taking a pen to paper and out of your mind just thinking about what would have happened to leave these remnants here. But the point is with these totally um, just unpredictable D6 rolls that you do connecting the parts together, quote unquote, randomly, it puts it together to allow you a place to explore something narratively. And I think that's really what the message that when I think about a random table, when I think about anything that is going to give me a semi-unpredictable group of thematic things, what I want leaving that is something that's going to lead me more toward the story, not simply something that's going to leave me something placed in a room. So the Wandering Monster Table, for example, is great to just generate something that populates a dungeon room or something that shows up in the landscape. But the random table for the solo RPG person needs to function a little bit as a GM would to advance the story in a way that is novel and maybe you haven't already thought of. So you're following up on some suggestions that you get from the random things that you generate. Given this, how do we get how do we get a table that yields a story and not simply just a population of things or items or encounters? The first thing to do is make sure that you name your table. And don't just give it a name. Make sure that it is a descriptive name or an evocative name. What do I mean by this? Well, for example, let's just say you're doing an overland adventure and you're not working from a predetermined map. You want to have, you want to create a random table at the outset of different types of terrain that you're going to be walking over. 
you could simply make a list and you could write down Rocky, you could write down Sandy, you could write down a mountain, you could write down planes, one, two, three, four. You could write down the sea even if you wanted to be adventurous and do that. Something I really haven't done but I think is a really cool idea as an aside. And let's say you could write down a swamp. You have your terrain table. You've done this because you know that you have ways of working within placing your characters within these things. You have resources. Your rule set works with them. For whatever reason, these are the options that you want to give yourself, but you want a little surprise, so you make it into a table. That's fine. But imagine if you approached it slightly differently. Imagine if you approached it as, rather than just terrain, imagine if you approached it as some type of evocative terrain, something to do with an emotion and a terrain. Well, what do I mean by that? Imagine, and again, it's more work, but it pays off, especially for the soloist. Imagine if instead of going right to the terrain table, in thinking about terrain, let's just, let's be a little less ambitious and just do it a D4 table. Nobody, nobody ever makes a D4 random table, but we're going to do that. And for this terrain, we're going to have three ty- or four types of emotions connected to terrain. What does that mean? Well, one of the terrain that we're going to roll on, one of the terrain tables, is going to be a peaceful terrain. One is going to be, say, a scary terrain. One is going to be a treacherous terrain. The difference between scary and treacherous, you may wonder. In this context, the, well, we'll get to that. Uh, So we've got peaceful, scary, treacherous. What's another emotion that we could think of with terrain? Well, we could think of it as rejuvenating. I'm revealing my spelling difficulties. (laughs) These are different concepts. I think peaceful, we understand. The difference between scary and treacherous what I would say is that scary has to do more with things coming into the environment. Like, for example, it could be wandering monsters or NPCs that are unfriendly, whereas treacherous has to do with the environment itself. So it could be perhaps uh, a cliffside. It could be very rocky. It could be lava molten, things of that nature. And then, of course, rejuvenating would be that it would be bountiful in some way. Perhaps you could be foraging for supplies if you're working with a rule set where supplies are an issue, or it could be a place of rest, whatever. These are the emotions associated with the noun of terrain. Then what you would do is you would create four different, so you would be uh, initially rolling on this table. And in essence, what you would then have to create for yourself would be four subtables, and they could be however extensive you wanted them to be, that would fall under the category of peaceful. So what are, let's just go, say we're going to do a D6, uh, a D6 table for these. You could have your peaceful D6 table and think of six types of terrain that you might consider to be peaceful. It could be, um, and again, as descriptive as you want it to be, it could be a, um, let's say a garden outside a palace could be one example. It could be another peaceful terrain could be a farm or an area of farming suggested, suggestive of some type of peaceful habitation. Another peaceful terrain could be a wooded glade, maybe with evidence of magic, good magic, depending on how that fit your story and your rule set. Again, you're going to be tailoring these things to to your rule set. And I don't have any rule set or story here. I'm just trying to give the examples of how this would work. Filling this out the rest of the way. And we've got a cottage and a clearing, a pond and a pathway, a path down to a topiary. Anything along these lines. Those are peaceful things. Then we would continue to fill out the rest of the D6 until we had four random tables, subtables underneath this terrain. I finished sketching this out and I'm not going to go through everything. You can pause the video in an attempt to read my chicken scratch, but I'll give you an example of how it will work. So we'll roll some dice and we got four in the main table and a three in the relevant subtable. So that is going to bring us to the rejuvenating terrain. And within that, we find some abandoned adventurer packs. 
So if you were rolling for terrain in your story and you did that, you would find a place that had some abandoned adventurer packs. What you wouldn't necessarily be describing is the actual terrain per se. It's a feeling of what that terrain would give you. Let's give another example and see how that would, at least in my opinion, help you create more of a story. So we got a two and a five. So that is a scary uh, situation and five is bugbear. So that's more of a traditional wandering monster situation where you're coming in and there are going to be some bugbears there. And we'll try it one more time and see what we get. I think you sort of get the point here. One and a five. Peaceful and five is a pond. So you would be coming upon a pond and the feeling would be peaceful. Now, again, you are in doing this definitely doing more work because you're having to come up with these concepts or these ideas that are more than simply writing down six things like it's a mountain or it is a forest or whatever. But in terms of the story, if you were doing something like this and it was happening within a story, I think you can see how pairing some kind of an emotional description with the concrete thing that is in the table is going to be helpful in terms of moving the story forward. If you're going to the trouble to design your own random table, then the, the message here, the first part of the message is that involved in that random table should not simply be a choice of things or places, but should in some way be a choice or a direction of an emotion or a feeling. Sorry, I need to interject an editorial correction here because when I went back in this in editing, it seems like I'm telling you what you should do. And that's not really what I mean, even though I'm using the word should. What I mean is if you're going to take the trouble to create your own random tables, I think this is a useful way of thinking about it. All right, now let's get back to the video. Because emotions and feelings are the things that need to be present in a story in order for the reader of the story, or in this case, the player of the story, who is you as well as the creator of the story, to want to know the really singular question that drives every RPG and every other type of story, which is what happens next. If you don't ask that question, if you're not wondering about that question, you may find yourself at a place of standstill. And this is true whether you are running, you're a GM running a table of players through some adventure, or certainly if you are trying to do some type of solo work for yourself with an RPG set, with an RPG rule set. Because once you cease to be interested in the question of what happens next, it becomes uninteresting. It becomes a chore. It becomes boring. Random tables can really go in two directions. And this is where it gets back to the point that I was talking about earlier that I said I wasn't really going to address so much is um, this question of whether a GM turning to a random table is in some sense lazy and not creating the narrative for him or herself, or is actually being creative in allowing some unpredictability to creep in, an unpredictability which he or she then needs to hang their own story on. And sometimes if you're feeling like you're not sure where to go with a story, if you have the confidence to throw in something that is semi-unpredictable and then anchor that for the direction of the story moving forward, you will get to more of a place of wondering what happens next. And it's being in that place of wonder, it's staying in that place of wonder that is important, especially if you're trying to do this for yourself. As the soloist, we are both trying or by necessity being the GM and being the player. And we're trying to do this almost impossible, impossible dance between those two extremes that are actually opposites, but that we have to do both at the same time during the course of a session or during the course of many sessions if we're playing something that is longer than just sort of one sitting. And again, once we lose interest in the question of what happens next, our story dies.
our adventure dies or around the table. It's just, it's a dead session, you know? Yeah, sure. There's another wandering monster. Okay. It's not taking you anywhere. It might be doing something else, but it's not transporting you somewhere else. And so the main message that I think of that a random table can do for you is to give an opportunity to go somewhere else, to give an opportunity for something semi-unpredictable to come into play that then becomes something that you can think about and move forward from, use as a launching point for, to do something else. Memorable design. Why are you, you're on videotaping. <laughs> I know, shouldn't I write design? No, I don't think we need to say that. Just, I think. all right, just write it on then. All right.